Right, welcome to our Grounds Week Q&A. We uh, celebrated Grounds Week with the GMA last week and we wanted to mark that with a Q&A with our expert panel. I'll introduce them in a second. But we've invited your questions over the last week and had a good response from the club network. The expert panel, we have got Team Aegeus Bowl joining us from various locations, I think. Simon, afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. You're at home, are you? Um, yeah, I'm in the cottage uh, at the site at Geosville, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and Tom, it, Tom that's Cowley? A, that's about as much home as I get at the moment, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> yeah, uh, and Tom <laughs> is in uh, one of the pavilions at the ground as well. Hi, Tom. Hi, everyone. Uh, and then we've got Darren. Simon Darren is the regional pitch advisor for the Grounds Management Association. We've spoken to him before on Umpire Strikes Back podcast. Hi, Darren. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and then I haven't got them on the expert panel list, or I really should, but we've got um, members of the HCB team, John Cook and Simon Jones, who are going to offer the club perspective on things as and when needed. Hi, John, and hi, Simon. Afternoon, Rob. Afternoon, everybody. Hello, all. Hi. And we were due to have Chris Westbrook with us, the county pitch advisor, but technical difficulties we won't go into now, but hopefully we can get his input on some of these questions as we go on. So, but the... Questions kind of fell into a number of categories. Firstly, around pre-season, obviously where we are at the moment. Lots of questions from clubs about what they should be doing at the moment. I'm just going to ask the questions and then be quiet, really, and let the experts speak. So having scarified the outfield, what is the best treatment to eradicate moss from the outfield? Who would like to come in on that? I'll come in straight away. So, um, I mean, look, moss is obviously, it's a difficult thing, especially on a club level. Um, because really the best thing to eradicate moss out of your outfield would be to have a, a better grass coverage. You know, so you haven't got that space uh, for the moss to develop. But, you know, even, even ourselves at the Aegis, but we've got some moss in some of our areas. Now, probably the best thing really um, is something that we used to do at Taunton uh, quite regularly would be to, to use lawn sand. That obviously helps kill off the moss uh, at the start of the year, blackens it off. And then obviously you can try and then promote some grass covering uh, as we get into the spring um, to try and thicken up those areas to then, I say, eradicate the moss through trying to um, blank out that space. I mean, it's difficult, you know, it, it all depends on sometimes finance, doesn't it? Um, you know, you look at around it, most golf courses and uh, and some cricket clubs would, would spray iron, which is another way of trying to, to kill off the moss and then, then promote the, that grass growth. But I think all you can do especially with scaffolding, the, the more often you do it, you know, if you can reseed, the, the more times you do it, the, the less likely the moss is going to be over, over a longer period of time, really. Any, anyone else on that one? I've fallen for the mute button first. No, that's all right. I'm, <clears throat> I'm happy to um, contribute on this one. I think that what we always try and promote as well is... Um, to be proactive rather than reactive, especially with something like this. So the moss in its very nature loves damp, compact ground. So the most that you can aerate when possible in the autumn to try and prevent it, put your treatments down. I know I used to use seaweed quite often um, in the autumn time on my squares uh, as a bit of a preventative measure. Um, because the, the moss itself doesn't really have a, a, a sort of an active root system. So it sits on top of the very moist, compact ground. So the, 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 the better you can make the environment that's undesirable to the, to the, to the moss, the better. So we're always keen to promote uh, being proactive with the management as opposed to reactive, because it can be very aggressive once it takes hold. Great. Thanks, Darren. Tom, do you want to, on the next one, between now and 10th of April, how many times should one roll a square which drains pretty well? Um, obviously, it depends on conditions and weather. You don't want to go out there if you're going to cause harm. Maybe it's slightly damp and stuff. I think it just cause more damage than good. Um, I think, yeah, when conditions are right, really, would be the main one and to sort of use that window of opportunity as well as you can. I'm good on that. Obviously, you roll to a point where you sort of, the dentist will make a, compact it to a certain level, a bit like what we've done with the blotters, and then 
you're sort of not really going to achieve anything with the dentist and you'd look to go up to the bigger rollers so all sort of we sort of do hit by hours so we have to do 10 hours with a blotter so you could maybe do 10 hours with a dentist and see see how that feels really it's a touch if you feel like a bigger roller could get on it then go with that or then just use your dentist to be cut in the square um because obviously with the new rolling studies and obviously sort of less is more now so you don't really want to be out there for hours and hours rolling if you're not really going to achieve anything with the dentist but definitely to start with you you will see some benefit I think a lot I think a lot of people obviously get quite focused on dates um with rolling Uh, and you know the best advice you can always give to someone is you know if the conditions are right you can do some work but if the conditions don't feel right then it's best not to roll I mean you'll do way more damage rolling in bad conditions and then trying to get those pitches back than actually what you'll do by doing less rolling. Um, like Tom said, you know, apart from rolling in the square for about 10 hours with our blotters, we've just left the middle of our squares and focused on single wicket prep almost straight away. And, and the actual squares hardened off absolutely fine in the last couple of weeks. You know, the, the weather does the work for you. Um, you know, longer daylight hours, warmer temperatures, you get a little bit more evaporation coming out of the surface. So I don't think there's a, a set number on, on how many times or, or what like that. I think you just have to do what's right. And, you know, last year with COVID, I think a lot of people probably didn't do any preseason rolling at all. Um, and then yet yeah, teams were back playing uh, back in the middle of the summer. Uh, and certainly ourselves, we didn't, we stopped our preseason rolling straight away and, and managed to get pitches up and running fairly quickly. So I think that's a, that would be my main thing would say, don't get too worried about a date and doing a certain amount of time, but more focus on the conditions and make sure you do it at the right time with those conditions. Thanks, Simon. That probably leads into the next question there about uh, has, has the rolling, your rolling changed from your move from Somerset? Um, no, I, I suppose I've just tried to do more here than at the Aegeus Bowl from what I used to do at Taunton. So, my sort of rolling style pre-season came from the fact that when I took over in 2010, there was only three ground staff on the ground at Thornton. And I basically didn't have the time to be rolling the whole square for 30 odd hours before rolling single wicket pitches out. Um, I know that's where I started using the blotter because it was a weighty machine with some foam on it. So it was quite protective on the grass. Uh, and then we'd go into wickets like that. So that's, that's, Really, I have transferred most things over. I think the only difference really is match pitches. These do take a little bit longer uh, to come together um, other than Taunton just because it's a, it's a newer surface. You know, it's only 20 years old, whereas Taunton, you know, they had, they've been playing cricket there since, you know, 1800s. So, you know, everything was a little bit easier. Everything came together a little bit quicker just because it had that natural compaction to it. Perfect. We move on to just some questions about ongoing maintenance. The first one's about removal of worm casts. Who's the expert on that one? I don't mind starting on that. It's always a bit of a, a bit of a contentious issue. This one. Um, <clears throat> uh, we always we always like to advise that you you try everything culturally and mechanical before you reach for the bottle. Uh, that is always very, very difficult with something like worm casts. Um, there used to be a, uh, a product that was available, carbindazine, which is now no longer legal to use, uh, if you like. Um, we encourage uh, regular brushing and reg- regular switching of surfaces, which, as we all know, is, is not always possible because you can still end up with a hell of a lot of smear um, and getting the casts when they're absolutely right to disperse at certain times of the year is nigh on impossible because they're just too damp. So it is a it is a real issue at the moment, I think. Um, obviously, I'm not allowed to recommend anything in the role that I'm in, uh, but there are products that are available, which people do use, which are actually, uh, they condition the soil, but an adverse effect on that is that it does... Um, it does uh, have an effect on the worms. Um, I'll probably leave that there for the moment and see if Simon wants to come in with any more. But the ideal, from my point of view, ideally cultural and mechanical before anything. 
That that would be my advice. But it's hard. Very diplomatic. I know it's hard. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> oh, yeah, look, it is difficult. I mean, even here, you know, we suffer from wearing cast on the, both grounds, the main ground, even though it's a sand-based um, outfield, because there's quite a bit of organic matter on the top from the turfing when they did it. Um, we do use the soil conditioner in question. And to be fair, I used to use it at Taunton and we got some very good results um, it resulting in the worms. Basically, you know, they, they, they come to the surface and dry out. Um, it's one of those, it's very difficult. You know, worms are, it's one of those actually problems you could probably suffer a little bit more than say something like leather jackets, which is probably going to be 10 times more troublesome uh, than anyone with worm cast. Uh, and, you know, let's face it, once you get into the season, actually, you know, once the ground starts hardening off, your worm cast issue generally goes away pretty much, unless you get a really very wet spell. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I would say that the conditioner is a good option, um, but it's, it's one of those things are only going to get harder on, on kind of pest and disease control, uh, even though we are out of Europe now things are still going to get very hard to, to manage because these kind of chemicals that used to be used 10, 20, 50 years ago just aren't going to be on the market. So trying to learn those techniques to mechanically help yourself, removal of fat and, and those kind of things um, is probably the best way forward, really. I don't know whether you've experienced this in your time, Simon. I'm sure you have. But one of my weapons of choice that I used to keep in my auto roller was a um, wallpaper scraper because you can have yeah. a square that is immaculate with absolutely no worm cast at all because you've treated it or whatever you've done. But the journey from shared to square usually involves <laughs> quite a lot of worm cast. So just before you approach the square in whatever direction you're aiming to roll in, the wallpaper scraper is your friend because you will need to remove uh, a whole lot of that off of the rails before you even go on to your square because I've I've done it I've thought oh no that's okay started to roll and you look behind and it's uh, it's quite sad that you've just managed to put all of that straight over your square so the wallpaper scraper is a, is a is a good tip I mean we're we're very lucky county cricket you you're not getting much on the square but we used to suffer a lot on the outfield at Taunton and you basically would be scraping off the rolls on the triple every time you stopped you empty the boxes because you you had about a a quarter of an inch of soil wrapped around each roller and you would literally just spend 10 minutes scraping it off to then go back and cut again uh 10 minutes later you'd be doing exactly the same thing is it yeah very frustrating the metal drag mats as well have you ever experienced yeah. this where you pick and pick and kick was always the well we used we use a harris fence um okay which is quite handy because it's light so it's not too abrasive but it's like you say trying to pick the worm cast at exactly the right time so it actually disperses them instead of smearing is yeah, very difficult. Now, you need a dry, uh, windy day, and you almost need to wait until about two o'clock in the afternoon so everything's dried out perfectly. But who can wait that long to do that kind of job? Not many. I find as well, you can time it. You can sometimes time it right um, with the frost coming out. Yeah. If yeah. you just come out when, when they've still got a bit of frost in there, but it's not, it's not in a, a situation where you shouldn't be walking on it. Mm -hmm. and you get the switch or the brush and they just... They can break up quite nicely then, but again, the timing of that has to be so perfect. And by the time you started, ten minutes later, the rest of the field isn't actually how you were <laughs> how you it to be. So it's it's a really, it's one of the most difficult situations for grounds people at the moment is the worms, and hopefully they are working on um, more remedies. Well, I'm certainly learning stuff. I never never realised worms are such an issue. So good to hear. Um, Final one on this one. So how to promote good grass coverage due to large areas of bare, no coverage of grass on outfield, sand-based soil. Any tips on that one? I would say, I can this one, I would say what we've done here that's worked well for us is sort of we've made a seed bed. We all have to have a dimple seeder. Um, clubs you could use a fork or something along that to create lots of holes and then apply seed into that and germination sheets to keep it covered and allow the grass to establish. Um, we found that works really well for us. We've just done a few little patches on the nursery ground that needed a bit of seed and some sand to, to fill them up. And we've just put some germination sheets over that and hopefully the, the seed will come through. Um, it's just, I think it's 
to achieve good coverage, you have to put a little bit of time and get plenty of holes and stuff into your surface so that the seed has somewhere to bed into. Don't just put it on top so that will allow water and stuff just to move it away and you still have the bare patches. So you actually get the seed into the soil and give it a light covering, then you stand a better chance of actually the seed taking and starting to get better coverage. And you've had, Matt, there's been a massive change in the nursery ground from when I think we, when we finished in the office last, ma- last March to this March, it looks pretty different, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it, it couldn't have gone much better, really, with what we've done, taking 20 millimetres off. I think that when we stripped it first, it was just a, a field of leather jackets just sat there. It was quite extraordinary to see what was going on. And we think we've got rid of them by stripping it all off. And yeah, we, we used the grading to the seabed and we spiked to a couple of inches. So we've got plenty of, of holes and options for the seed. And then we, we overseeded and brushed it all in. So it was all covered and then we top dressed the following day. And we're very lucky with right conditions and a few germination sheets out. We had a bit of growth within a week. So, yeah, it couldn't have gone much better. Great. So we've got a club here. I think this is actually from the Royal Navy, actually. This is uh, someone who's not planning to play until next year. So what maintenance can they do this year? Um, yeah, <laughs> those numbers and figures don't mean anything to me, but hopefully they do to you guys. <laughs> Just taking me time reading it first. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, if, if, especially with fresh pitches, I mean, especially coring down to that depth and then rebuilding, the, the key is basically to, to tread very lightly. Um, you know, like I was saying about pre-season rolling, you know, you, you could get on there with a, a mower, um, especially a pedestrian mower with a roller, a little bit too quickly and actually then start sinking in. You want to almost try and promote the grass growth first, try and get the grass growing. So you maybe just lightly cuss it with a, a fly mower or a hover mower or anything like that. Just try and take the weight off. And then as the summer comes, as the, the ground dries out, as the, everything gets a little bit harder, then you can start adding a little bit more weight. Um, but also um, you want to try and spike as well, because you, you want to try and get those roots to go down as deep as possible. And if they're not looking on playing until next year, then, Root development is the key, really, to then binding those that pitch together to then try and get onto a good surface a year after. Great. Thanks, Simon. I'd say the good news about that question as well is the time. Mm. It's, it's, it's good to read that they're not planning to use it until 2022. Because um, with any kind of rebuild or anything like that, you do need to give it a decent amount of time to settle down. We've certainly known clubs that have um, gone through similar processes and and just used it too quickly, and it's it's not settled and it's not ready. So patience can be the key, and then just keeping on top of it as best you can. Okay, fantastic. Uh, next question is all about trees. Uh, so, yeah, me, me, me and Tom were me and Tom were talking about this one because we saw okay. this question before, and it it's a really difficult. I don't mm-hmm. think there's a, a really easy answer to give to that. There's a lot of issues, you know. Obviously, with a preservation order on the tree, you know, you, you're not going to be a, you can't prune the roots to help uh, with the current surface. Really, uh, I think the only thing you can do um, before they can um, try and raise some money to move that area is basically try and give that artificial surface a good clean out, try and remove any debris. Cause I can imagine there's quite a lot of leaf litter that maybe falls on it over the winter and that can affect the bounce on artificial pitches and maybe just a light roll. Um, you know, even either with a pedestrian mower or if they've got a hand roller or anything like that, just a light roll just to try and cons- consolidate that surface. Cause the, the shell that they use to build up those artificials will probably be moving and would have had would have moved over the last couple of years with those roots. So, yeah, just to try and do a little bit of almost normal wicket rolling, you know, to try and get that surface to as a consistent level as they can do, really. I really yeah. like this question when it came through because it looked like a question. It was like on an exam or something. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really kind of like, it was lots to think about and it was really interesting. Uh, without actually seeing how bad the damage is from the roots. It's quite a difficult one to diagnose. Um, 
I agree with what Simon was saying, but it also it, it sounds to me, depending on how bad it is, then that there isn't a huge amount of uh, of of, it, of anything maintenance wise that you could necessarily do to eradicate the problem. You know, you've got the issue with the tree, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I actually um, I cheated on my exam. I, uh, I got in contact with uh, uh, Duncan Jenkinson from the ECB to see if he would uh, give some advice uh, in relation to the nets, because obviously there is potential funding for things like this. And uh, they recommended that the first thing to do, I don't know where they got the quote from, but they recommended to go back to the original installers to see if anything could be done. And also, we don't know the size of the area. So if there is an option to relocate within the ground to an area that isn't going to be affected by this, then that would be brilliant as well. But again, all of those things are cost-based. Um, but he did encourage this person to, if, if they wanted to, contact um, the ECB and see if there is any uh, anything that they could do to help. So that is, the, I don't mind if they want to come through me or come through you. That's fine. Okay, so, thank but, you, Darren. So that's that's from Tim Jacobs at Portsmouth and South Sea. So um, Simon Jones coming on this one, but I've been to the ground a few times. There's probably not enough space there to relocate, is there? It's a tight little ground, very nice, but tight little ground. That's right. Yeah, Tim has been in, in touch with me um, on this one as well. Um, so um, I think, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we, uh, it's not likely a relocation. It's just a question of whether um, uh, we can sort of sort anything um, uh, just to just to make it playable in the in the meantime. So yeah, we're well and truly on the case, and that's great advice that, that Darren's given as well. It's going exactly the right route. So we'll keep talking, Tim. No pun intended there, Simon, I'm sure. Um, and finally, so this is for Simon, Tom, Darren as well. J J Simon Jones, I know you've definitely got dream purchases for the garden as well. Um, and, and Cookie, possibly. What dream purchase for the GS Bowl? Tom, if we start with you, because you, we see you quite regularly on Twitter with the, the new bits of machinery that you get to play with. What would, what would be the one thing you'd like to buy? Well, it could be quite a long list, this. <laughs> a lot of the stuff we've got is quite old. I'd say, I'd probably say a wicket mower at the minute would be top of the list because we've got one uh, paladin that's really, that's brilliant. And it's doing a lot of work at the minute. I'd say probably another another wicket mower because we do we do cut a lot of grass, I'd say, would be one of the main, one of the main things. Okay, let's see if the boss agrees. Uh, I, I do agree. Um, yeah, the list Does the is... budget agree? Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah. hopefully, uh, if, if, you, if I state it in the right ter um, terms, I'm sure I yeah. can try and get an answer to the positive. Uh, look, Tom's right. We actually do have quite a lot of ageing stock. I mean, the one thing I would probably say that I would be my dream purchase is not actually a machine. I want to redo the outfield on the main ground. So, you know, that needs that we corroded on the nursery last year. Uh, and I'd like to do that on the main ground um, this year, if I can, if not the year after. So that that's a fairly sizable area with quite a lot of work and contracting work available. So that could be my dream purchase, I think, at the moment. Great. Darren, anything for you? Uh, well, I've already made mine. Okay. You, Jess, because uh, I've got tickets to uh, the Sri Lanka, English Sri Lanka T20 on the 26th of uh, June. So I've made my dream purchase for the Ajayas. Okay. Uh, having not been through anything like that for a very long time. And my second dream purchase when I get there will probably be a nice cool drink with my friends. Yeah. So, with everything yeah. that's been going on recently, I will certainly be looking forward to that. Definitely. That sounds great. Um, Simon, what about you for the garden at home? Simon Jones, any? You've got a long list as well, haven't you? I, I, I think um, a, a, what's the right word? A sorrel roller, a spiked roller, so that I don't have to aerate my lawn with one implement that's basically got five prongs and is the size and I have to go all the way up and down the garden. I thought I could even, they're quite good for gardeners as well, if I can get hold of one of them, and I think they're a bit rare. Um, as second-hand purchases, I could even, you know, make a bit of the side by loading it out to you because you're working in your garden as well, Rob, aren't you? Yeah, so. indeed. Yeah, yeah. Um, good. And just so before we go on to just talk about clubs, Simon and Tom, big news this morning that the DS is going to host the World Test Championship final. Yes, that's been a long time coming, that announcement. I can tell you yeah, that yeah. now. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, it's fantastic news, isn't it? It's, um, it's great to have that final. You know, it's pretty prestigious. It's the first one ever. Um, we're obviously in a very good position to have those games now uh, with the potential of COVID. Who knows what could happen there? Um, so, you know, the hotel on site being a potential bio bubble or hopefully having crowds. We don't quite know yet, but yeah, it's going to be an exciting, well, six days because we've got a reserve day to the test match as well for weather. So I might just get an absolute road out and play six days of cricket. That'd be quite good fun, <laughs> wouldn't it? Like a, time, like a timeless test. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, looking forward to it. And you've got, there's quite a busy time because there's a T20 straight after as well, isn't there? England T20 and then uh, the blast starts as well. Yeah, there's a lot of um, infrastructure to try and sort out. So we've basically got two days to completely de-rig the ground from an ICC perspective, which is who will be running the test match, to an ECB perspective. So complete branding, rechange on the ground, change of pitch, obviously, for us. Uh, one set of teams out, another set of teams in, practice facilities. Yeah, the list is endless on the jobs that need doing in two days. Oh, well, yeah, exciting times, though, lots to look forward to, and I hope, just hope we can get some crowds in as well. That'd be really good. Yeah, um, so. John, just from you, because you've just taken over the, the kind of running of volunteers and grounds teams as, um, recreationally, are we keen to start some kind of group on social media as well, I think? John's still there. Sorry, Rob, Rob, I'm very... I'm very much here, but but time beautifully with my children returning back from school. Oh, obviously, sorry. Ju jubilant from not being locked down for uh, the last seven or so weeks. So I do apologise. Um, well, I need to repeat the question, my friend. So just saying that you've just uh, just taken over the, the kind of running of volunteers, which includes grounds teams, um, and start keen to start some kind of group community on social media as well. Yeah, yeah. So I had the privilege of catching up with with Darren not so long ago and just talking about different ways um, that we can probably just bring this this group of people together. I mean, listen to this expert panel. You know, it's absolutely fascinating for me. Yeah. Um, it, almost where my background in terms of working with volunteers mainly comes from from coaching. You know, it sounds like a very innovative group of people. Um, you know, we probably say as coaches, it depends. It seems that uh, the panel are saying if the conditions are right, you know, let the weather do work for you. And I'm just interested to know actually what the combination is or the balance of um, science and versus instinct before I sort of move into, into my response. How would you guys see that? Sorry, I can... I can you just uh, repeat the question again? Only because Alfonso Thomas was messaging me about something for work and I was looking at my phone. I apologise. That's a, that's, a that's a different type of child coming back. <laughs> yeah, very much so. <laughs> I was just saying, Simon, it was just, it was just been brilliant to listen to all of you. Um, but I guess, and, and me trying to understand more about this, this art, how, how, me, how much is perceived to be gut and instinct versus the balance of science? You know, I'm, I'm quite a traditional groundsman. I, I, you know, when I started at Taunton, Phil Frost, who was a head groundsman there, very traditional, didn't really... I learned a lot by just basically being sat on the roller and watching what was done. So, you know, my first few pitches were just a feel, 100%. But actually, over the last 10 years, the amount of science that has come in uh, to the industry, and specifically on cricket and cricket pitch development, uh, and then biology and, and plant biology and stuff like that is huge. And, uh, you know, I mean, Tom's probably had a steep learning curve because I've brought in a lot of um, science into what we do now at the Aegeus Bog. So I've used a lot of biology over the last couple of years and I get tremendous results out of it. And, uh, you know, the fertilizer levels that we're using on a sustainability side of things is dramatically reduced. And we're getting as good a results by working with nature through science uh, than we were with just using chemicals. So I think when it comes to actual pitch preparation, a lot of it's gut, but when it comes to the overall, a lot of it now is science-based and science-led. That's brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, I'd say, Simon, as well, from, um, from, from a grounds person point of view, uh, I don't know whether you had the same uh, when, when you were first starting out, but you get, you get to a point in in your career with this i mean everything that we do pretty much is is science this this trade is very scientific um a lot a lot more scientific than i think people give credit to it and 
you kind of get to a stage as a grounds person where you stop you stop asking how to do something and then you step over to to ask why you're doing it and then when you when you make that leap and you start to learn about why this is beneficial to the living organism that we're working with the soil and everything that's involved in that once you start asking those questions and researching it and with me certainly a, a, a light went off in my head and then you just want to learn more and more and more and it is it's massively science-based um and very very skilled so what you guys are doing is is massively underrated and very highly skilled so um uh going back onto grounds week you know we should all be very proud of what we're able to achieve and it was a good way of um of, of, of shouting about that so uh yeah hopefully that's uh, even even your your local club groundsmen i mean they probably don't even know how much soil science and grass biology they actually know just by working on their grounds for, for however many years you know it, it all comes down to that at the end of the day you know and the, every 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 pitch will have its own tendencies and they're um they would have learned those over the years and you know i've had to learn here very steeply last year how this pitch reacts to the techniques that i brought in and then the science around it and um you know i had to do that off a really you know very short run-up really um and we'll probably change a few things this year because we're adapts but yeah you know they say that science will always be there and i think people don't realize it which is true which is a shame as well but it's very difficult you know it's very difficult to talk about groundsmanship and what you do it's very difficult sometimes to get that emphasis across about all the things that come together in your head uh, for you to then do the work and get a cricket pitch out it's, it's quite difficult sometimes to get that across i think Thanks, guys. That's that's brilliant. And and I guess you know when when we had a chance to catch up, Darren, we talked about um, Groundsmen's Association, you know, and just the opportunities with the membership um, schemes that are available that are in in development at the moment. But you were talking about um, online courses that were just you know value for money, worth their weight in gold. And it sounds like all three of our our panelists, you know, just a little bit of extra knowledge goes a long way by the sounds of it, just to bring people up to speed. Yeah, definitely. Um, when I when I first started out on my career, it, it was it wasn't very obvious the route that you could take. Um, you sort of you might you might start with an apprenticeship or or an MVQ level two. You'd get your maybe move on to your level three, and then it seemed like there was quite a bit of a almost a bit of a dead end there, and you didn't really didn't know what else to do. This was my personal experience anyway. I don't know whether the other guys felt felt the same. Um, Mind you, this was about 20 years ago. So, um, And then it was kind of the leap, if you were willing to take it, was to a degree. And from an MVQ to a level three was, uh, so, sorry, from, a, from an MVQ level three to a degree was, was a massive leap and it wasn't for everyone. Uh, but what the GMA have been able to do over recent years is, is create a very, um, very clear path from someone who's never picked up a fork if they want to, they can study all the way up to grounds manager level and we can support them along the way. And that's fantastic because that was never around when I first started, not really. Um, so in terms of uh, what's available now that's, that's really attractive to, uh, for cricket and indeed winter pitches, you can do uh, an online level one cricket and level one winter pitches. If you've got football in your outfields, that could be very helpful to you. Um, online, £25. And that will get you started if that's what interests you. And I, I fully encourage anyone to take it because at that price as well, there's no real reason not to, I think. And we'll be building on those as it goes and um, hopefully encouraging guys to join us as well. So the memberships are all online. So so come and join us and let us help you along your, your journey, if you like. Just to go over what Darren said, I remember when I first started, I didn't have a clue. And I remember I was volunteering at my club and I went on a, I think it was two days split. You had a spring, summer, then autumn, winter. It may have been through the GMA or was the IOG, just a course. And for any volunteer, it just gives you a little bit of basic knowledge to be able to go back to your ground and actually sort of have confidence in knowing what you can do. And then it's, you know, it's up to you. You can take it on yourself to then learn more 
and do the other courses and get more information. As you do more, you'll pick up more of the science side of it as well. So I highly recommend volunteer wise, look like looking at things like that. Cause it, it gave me a really good base to start from sort of going back to my club and being, Oh, I, I can do this. I, I know how to do that. And it sort of gives you a good foundation. And then you sort of learn, like Simon said, about your ground as you're doing it, you might do something and be, oh, that works quite well. Well, that didn't work quite, quite so well. And you just tinker, tinker things as you go. And then all of a sudden, your knowledge is really expanding. Brilliant. Simon Jones, you're going to come in there, I think. Raise his hand very politely. Absolutely. You know me, Rob, yes. Um, no, I, I, I did the, um, the spring and summer uh, preparation course back in the late 90s when it was still the IOG rather than the Grounds Management association i think hampshire groundsman nigel gray was on the same course it was at the langley manor cricket club but i'm quite old so it was quite a, lo a long time ago and i did that with a view of uh, helping out at my my club um, back in those days i'd take a, a week off in april to just work on the ground um for a week you know i'd become club captain at quite a young age and thought well actually maybe i need a muck in here um, uh, and help out the, the head groundsman uh, and I'm sure he was grateful for most of the help I gave him um, and uh, uh, I found that was a way of just getting, in, getting into it and actually uh, just kind of helping out. I think there is one point that was made earlier in the, to do that and as the case of many volunteers it's, it's a great thing to say yes we'll all work when the time is right etc um, but if you're a volunteer, you don't necessarily have that flexibility in time. So you could take some time off and it could be chucking down and chucking it down. And if you're a, a professional uh, a, a groundsman, yeah, all right, OK, we'll pack up. We'll do other stuff the next day. Whereas, you know, it's it's quite difficult out there in, in, uh, in, in sort of club land to actually we know how difficult it is for volunteers to schedule their time. On the other hand, I think throwing forward to just the summer just gone I, I took the um, online level one as well and it was a great uh, refresher and I would absolutely recommend the value um, of it um, financially and in terms of the content as well and I can certainly say as someone, someone a bit more on the uh, language and literature side I did find it quite scientific and that wasn't necessarily my strength because I got an E and U in, in and a U in my science so levels so so yes it was it was a good study and it was a hard study but um, you know hats off to the professional scientists we've got in the house. Okay well thank you everybody I've uh, always enjoy listening to experts talk passionately about what they're really <laughs> experts in so really appreciate your time thank you for I guess it made it slightly easier to give up your time today, Simon and Tom, the fact that it's been lashing down with rain all day. Yeah, it's not been the best day, has it, Tom? No, it's been a bit not frustrating. We had a good day yesterday, but yeah. yeah. Done with hopefully, um, hopefully, Hampton will be outside tomorrow, uh, having their first net outside. So, uh, all being well and everything being dry underneath the sheets, uh, yeah, we'll be getting going for our 2021 season. Yeah, that makes me very jealous. But good, good that they're going to be out playing while we're we will stick a suck at home, but hopefully we'll be joining them soon. Um, anyone else for anyone else before we finish? No, I just wanted to say thank you, Rob, really. I hope it's been informative for people. And I'm sure we're probably, you know, it might be even be worthwhile doing something in the middle of summer for autumn renovations and things like that. And if anyone's got any questions coming out of their season, it might be a worthwhile thing to do again, mightn't it, really? Yeah, I'm sure it will. So we'll, we'll, we will send this to everybody, all clubs, and it will be on YouTube, and I'm sure it will spark more com more questions, so we might have to do another one. Simon, quickly, before we finish, you got... Yeah, just a quick um, appeal to clubs to say that the ECB Return to the Cricket Grant closes on the 15th of March. One of the eligible areas is recovering costs from pre-season, uh, from, from ground maintenance costs. So if your club is yet to apply, contact me at simon.jones.gsbowl.com or 07920 um, There's cost of up, uh, a grant of up to £3,000 available, and it is literally going soon. So, so please do not hesitate to get in touch um, uh, when you pick this up, uh, and we'll see if there's anything that can be done in the next couple of days. Brilliant. Well, Darren, thank you. Disappeared off my screen, but I think you're still there. Thank you very much, Darren. No problem. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Great to speak to you, Tom, Simon. Thank you. And Cookie and Josie, we'll see you soon. Thanks, Thanks all.